Good evening, everyone. My name is Antonis Kotsonas, and I'm the president of the New York Society of the Archaeological Institute of America. It is uh, my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's lecture, which was part of our lecture program for the academic year 2023-2024. As you know, we, oh, as you may know, we are a, a local society of the AIA, uh, which is uh, North America's largest and oldest archaeological organization with over 200,000 members worldwide. The AIA was, was established to support archaeologists and educators uh, in their work and also to promote excavation, publication, site preservation, and archaeological research in general. The, uh, the different programs and uh, the specialized and uh, non-specialized publications uh, issued by the AIA are intended to keep its members up to date with exciting archaeological discoveries and uh, research around the world. The AIA published two, uh, two important publications. First, the Archaeology magazine, which has a, a, an, a, an amazing readership of some 700,000 people per issue, which, uh, and it's written in an accessible way and communicates highlights of archaeological discoveries from around the world. Um, <clears throat> and of course, the, uh, the flagship journal of the AIA, the American Journal of Archaeology, which is the le leading journal uh, on Mediterranean archaeology, but also has a broader scope extending uh, to, to the Near East. Um, the uh, AIA offers its members all kinds of, of immersive opportunities. Uh, opportunities to join an excavation uh, or survey project, to attend lectures and fairs organized by local societies, and to visit spectacular uh, um, locations of archaeological interest through organized uh, a a tours. So um, if you're interested in archaeology and if you uh, see uh, the merit of the, the amazing work uh, the AIA has been doing since the 19th century, you should consider becoming a member and experience the, the excitement of discovery and enjoy the exclusive membership the AIA offers to members. You can see on your screen the details uh, of the link you can follow to join. Uh, but um, uh, you can also Google and find your way easily on uh, uh, the AIA website. Um, in addition to the, uh, the different uh, major initiatives developed by the AIA Central, our local society he, he has, uh, has a privilege of having the resources uh, of developing its own uh, initiatives. And the our uh, uh, board members and the members of our society are especially thankful to our friends, uh, thanks to the generosity of which we're able to, uh, to, to establish an initiative which um, provides free membership to the AIA and covers the fees of attending a, a, the AIA conference uh, to a number of undergraduate and beginning graduate students from institutions around the city. And uh, just, uh, just uh, uh, recently, we, uh, uh, we elected this year's cohorts, meaning the, the, the students who, uh, who are the AIA New York Society scholars. And I would like to, uh, to name them 
and uh, mention their institutional affiliation. And I would uh, like to ask them to um, uh, make themselves visible on screen and wave as they hear the names so that people in our community see, see the, the bright faces uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that have been given this exciting opportunity and of course be able later on where they hear more about them through our newsletter, uh, they be, will be able to connect uh, uh, the um, uh, the faces with uh, the uh, the interests uh, and the work. So, um, uh, in alphabetical order, uh, the students present tonight include Alison Blank from the Institute for the Study of the Ancient World at New York University my own institution. Um, also, we have uh, Eliana, e Elana Necher from the Bard Graduate Center. Hi, Elana. We have Michael Macori from the Bard Graduate Center. Uh, also, Alexander, Alexandra Prezzo from Barnard College. Hi, Alexandra. And um, sco other scholars who uh, uh, are not with us tonight, but will be attending future lectures, are um, really Dominiani from Fordham University and Malorius Mavromatis from NYU. As you can see, we are happy to give these opportunities to students from institutions around the city, uh, which... Uh, uh, which uh, gives them the distinct uh, places them in a distinct position of representing bridges between us and these different academic institutions. As I said before, you'll be hearing more about uh, these students in due course, especially through through our newsletter, and you'll be seeing more of them in future lectures. Thank you, thank you, guys, for uh, for being here tonight. We look forward to knowing more. Uh, of you. On this note, uh, I transition to today's uh, uh, lecturer and, uh, and his topic. Um, tonight, we will be uh, uh, having a lecture by Dr. John Soderberg, who is assistant professor at the Department of Anthropology and Sociology at Denison University. Dr. Soderberg previously taught at Ohio State University and also at the University of Minnesota, where he received his PhD. Thank for inviting me to be. Oh. Um, his MA was at Boston College and his BA at Middlebury College. Dr. Soderberg is an archaeologist who specializes in the study of animal remains, who, what we call a zoo archaeologist. His research explores how people use animals to define themsel themselves and shape relationships with others. In his very recent book, Animals and Sacred Bodies in Early Medieval Ireland, Religion and Urbanism, at Clone McNoise, Dr. Soderberg uses animal bones excavated uh, from the site and animal iconography to prove that Clone McNoise was one of Ireland's earliest cities and that animals were more than just food to its inhabitants. Animals is what made this place an intensely sacred place and in turn, then made a distinctive type of urban center, a sanctuary city that is possible. Dr. Soderberg is beginning a new project exploring the roles animals played for Gaelic groups in navigating the term, term, uh, tumultuous period after the Anglo-Norman conquest of Ireland in the 12th and 13th centuries. He and his students joined the team excavated at McDermott's Rock uh, in the past few summers. Uh, this site was a, a Gaelic lord's 
feasting retreat. His work at this site has been supported by a range of institutions and has resulted in numerous publications. And also more broadly, his work in Ireland. Uh, but Dr. Sordeberg also studies the use of 3D technologies for answering archaeological questions. He has used 3D technology to produce submillimeter scale models of or rock art, what we call petroglyphs, in Ohio. And uh, uh, this work has revealed previously unknown aspects of these carvings. Last but not least, Dr. Soderberg has held different offices at the American Society for Irish Medieval Studies, and he was once the president of that society. Tonight, Dr. Soderberg will present his lecture on the topic of gathering animals and making sacred space in early medieval Ireland. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, John, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and thank you to everyone for uh, gathering here tonight. I, I look forward to uh, talking a little bit about religion and uh, animals in early medieval Ireland. But uh, before I, I get into the details of that, I thought I might take a second just to situate uh, some of the, the things that I do, particularly in Ireland. And I just mentioned that one of my favorite aspects of being an archaeologist is the way that it collapses what we think of as past worlds and distant and distant places uh, in, into the concerns that we live in. Um, and how it asks us to view the world around us in a much bigger framework. Um, and uh, just to raise an example of that for you, um, you know, we've all probably had the experience of getting on one of these things. And that, that, that feels like a very immediate uh, experience of the present uh, and those sort of things. And you may also have uh, heard of the phenomenon of air rage that uh, surged horrifyingly uh, in the uh, immediate aftermath of COVID, uh, where you had a year or two where you had this just absolutely astonishing increase of people attacking each other and attacking um, airline attendants on 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 planes and all these sorts of things. This felt like a, a moment of, of of a very particular present sort of problem. And and if you this is from a, a study that was uh, looking at the impact of uh, FAA policies. People look at masking policies. All these sort of very immediate present sort of concerns were what came to the fore. But um, as an anthropologist and archaeologist, um, one of the things that it brought forward to me was what is one of my uh, favorite books that's ever been written by the biological anthropologist Sarah Hurdy. The uh, title there, as you can see, is Mothers and Others, and the uh, subtitle is The Evolutionary Origins of Mutual Understanding. Uh, and her very first chapter is titled Apes on a Plane. And her uh, view into the distinctive things about the human lineage actually begins. This is written in 2009, I think, um, well before uh, any of the things that I was just showing before. And she identifies um, in the uh, long history of humanity, one of her icons of the extraordinary capacities that human beings have developed is the ability to sit with each other on planes. I mean, she doesn't see this as a something that's locked into our genetic code or anything like that. It is a very carefully cultivated uh, set of capacities that we have developed literally in the last million years. That we, and, and she, in this book, argues that we need to cultivate it very, very carefully. Um, and for me, that just sets this sort of phenomenon in a much longer uh, chain of, of challenges and puzzles that humans being solve, uh, have solved for a very, very long time. So it just, it changes a little bit of the perspective of how we see things, if we can, if we can move into that much longer time frame. And fundamentally, I'm interested in cities um, for very much the same reason. They are uh, an incredibly pressing and very present phenomenon. Um, the World Health Organization estimates that currently over half of humanity lives in cities, and by 2050, their estimates are that some 70% uh, of, of humans will be living in an urban environment of some kind or other. So understanding how urban societies work, how they came about, uh, and different possibilities for organizing them is a deeply important task. But I, I think it's worrisome if we only think about those 
trends and the possibilities that have come up since the 19th or even the 16th century. Um, and we forget it. We, it. We're at our own peril if we forget that, that this is part of a 10,000 year long phenomenon that has taken all kinds of different forms. Um, and to understand the possibilities for solving all the challenges that urban life presents and, and all the possibilities it holds, um, we, it, it really benefits us a lot to look in this very long archaeological time frame. Um, and we can look back at this as a case of, of, of Chatelhuyuk, um, very beginnings of urbanism. There are things that we casually, if we ask people what are the key features of an urban center, they're just not there. Um, and that changes our understanding of the relationships that we're driving cities uh, and all that is necessary to get them started and to get them going and, and um, begins to reframe some of that. And we can stop seeing it as kind of this linear progression of, oh, we started here, we moved to this. And all these possibilities uh, start to swirl around. Um, and so I, I, I view looking at, and I've spent most of my adult life looking at ideas about urbanism and why, why people live in them. Um, these are the very present phenomenon, and, 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 but they're part of this long trajectory and we need to see all of that. Um, moving a little bit closer to topic for tonight, um, why do I study cities in Ireland in particular? Um, and those of you who study the Middle Ages at all, or if you've had any kind of even glancing encounters with it, We'll probably know that this central part of Western Europe tends to dominate our imagination of what the Middle Ages are all about, how things happen, what are the key processes of the Middle Ages tend to um, focus in these areas of what eventually became the Holy Roman Empire. And if you look up at the top uh, right, left of the screen, you can see Ireland there that literally doesn't even make it onto the map um, and is um, you know, a couple of rivers in there, but otherwise it contributes nothing to this kind of vision into it. Um, and I think there's a lot of advantage to moving out away from these sort of central places where our basic stories about anything are built um, and moving off into the edges of the map to see, well, how did all of that work elsewhere? What are, what are some of the ways that, that work? And by trying to bring Ireland a little bit more into focus, uh, like the long history, we can see possibilities for how the Middle Ages were happening and in particular why cities are happening. So I, I look to Ireland to see uh, different ways that the Middle Ages could happen, different ways that, that cities could happen. Um, and just to give you a quick little thumbnail sketch of how that's worked out and some of the challenges of being very focused on other parts of Europe. Um, this quote that I'm giving you here, and I, I will tell you right now, that I think this is the only time I will be giving you a lot of text on the screen. So don't worry, I'll read it out to you if it's a little hard to see. Um, but it captures uh, the assumption about Ireland um, that's embedded in that map. Um, when we started the historic Ta Irish Historic Towns Atlas series in the early 1980s, we realized that Irish settlement history suffered from an invasion is caused by the belief that successive changes in the Irish countryside were to be exclusively attributed to the arrival of a foreign group. Um, and this famous scholar, Binchy, ends up thinking and, and developing a sense of Irishness, which is directly opposed to urbanism and all that is modernity. And you can see how in this sense that cities can't be in Ireland. Uh, the question of questions about how they came there come right to the fore and they start to get at all kinds of assumptions here. And you can see kind of, as, as I said, the assumption embedded in that map is that, well, not much can be happening up in Ireland. Um, when you get into the second half of the 20th century, uh, post-World War II period, you get lots of new excavations. We start to see things and it became obvious fairly quickly, um, certainly by the time this Irish town uh, atlas was starting, that uh, urbanism has much deeper roots in Ireland, and Ire Ireland is participating in the same sorts of things the rest of Ire the rest of Europe is participating in, um, but they may play out a little bit differently. And understanding how they play out differently is crucial. And here you can see uh, the literally cartoon version of what Viking settlements would have looked like. Um, and it said by the by the um, once you get into the second half of the 20th century, last decades of the 20th century, <laughs> um, it's clear that. 
um, ur urbanism developed in, uh, in Ireland, but there's still that sense that maybe it's coming from outside and people are beginning to work with how these places were woven into it. And there's a long train of really interesting research about uh, the intersections of Irishness and Vikings and how it is that that created a set of urban centers. But fundamentally, these urban centers look a lot like the urban centers that you see in uh, appearing in other parts of Europe. Um, and the type that's captured my attention um, for uh, quite some time is uh, another possibility for urban beginnings in Ireland. Um, and there are early references and a lot of suggestions that it may be that the earliest urban centers in Ireland are developing around monasteries um, and not on the coast, right in the thick of the center. And these are really unlikely places for urban centers to develop. They go against a lot of the assumptions about what it is that drives urban. These are not highly centralized kingships. Uh, market economies are a very small presence in the area, the kind of things that, that, that we understand to drive a lot of the urban development just are hard to see there. So this is a possibility for digging deeper into what is it that can drive people to develop urban centers. Um, and um, I was fortunate enough to participate in the excavations of the only one of these potentially urban monasteries uh, that has been extensively excavated. Um, here you can see Clon McNoise uh, located in the Midlands of Ireland in this fairly boggy central area. You can see here that it's right on the banks of the Shannon River um, that uh, are a important reason for uh, its location there. It's the major north-south uh, uh, tran uh, transit point through Ireland, so it's a major routeway north and south through Ireland. Um, and it is also in this area in County Offaly, uh, a location where you have these series of gravel ridges, which generally speaking run east-west across Ireland. Um, and there the, uh, were major routeways across the kind of boggy center of the island. So Comic Noise sits right at this, uh, the crossing point of these two major east-west and north-south routeways. Um, it is also at a point in the Shannon where the lowlands flood every year. Um, and uh, the, and sometimes a year, uh, the Shannon River, the Shannon River is is back from the banks of Clon Macnoise, and at other times of year it laps right up into uh, what would have been the medieval settlement. And then when that drops again, uh, you have this lovely lush pasture land that grows up. Um, so there there are a lot of uh, ecological and geological uh, reasons why this would be a a, a point to put uh, a, an important settlement. Um, here you see a couple of views of, of what Claw McNoise uh, looks like today from the air. Um, and it is a fairly flat landscape. Um, uh, and you can see in the background right here, this uh, callow land, which is wonderful pasture land that extends out in front of it. Um, but it also, you can see in the top picture here, uh, subtly, it's also a very prominent point in the landscape uh, where you come rising up. And so it's, it's the, the monuments there are fairly impressive. If you um, have encountered Claw McNoise before, you are likely to have seen um, probably its most famous set of monuments. These, these are called high crosses or monumental, highly sculpted crosses that's approximately two meters high um, that are encrusted with all kinds of very redolent iconography. Um, but those are, and the red arrow there is pointing to um, where those high crosses sit in, in the whole settlement. Um, they're at the center of, um, what was the core of Clon McNoise. Uh, and uh, fortunately, there have been a whole series of excavations around the uh, site to get a sense of not only this central area, there are one or two small uh, sections in here, but also uh, the new graveyard excavations you can see down here uh, in this section uh, are the largest single uh, excavations of a um, potentially urban monastery. Um, uh, over, uh, I think, 1,200 square meters, um, about a meter or two deep. So uh, wonderful, rich, extensive excavations that yielded uh, a gigantic faunal assemblage that I'll be uh, taking you into in a few minutes. But there also have been a whole series of other excavations. And I, I won't go into the details of these, but you can see a um, 3D map of the area uh, indicating a whole series of other excavations. It's given us a really broad uh, interesting sense of what was going on in these. It just simply isn't available from anywhere else. This is a really wonderful opportunity to see what, excuse me, um, see what these uh, monasteries look like. Um, 
uh, in the early Middle Ages. I should say, sorry, Iran early, uh, early on, I should have given you the chronology. Um, so in Ireland, we're talking about the early Middle Ages. We're talking about the period from uh, the first few centuries of the Common Era. Um, 300 is a good round date where you start to see some settlement changes that come in. Um, by uh, four or 500, uh, you start to see uh, transition to Christianity and a whole series of changes that, that uh, build through the uh, rest of the millennium, um, which is the early Middle Ages. The later Middle Ages in Ireland are um, typically marked by the Anglo-Norman invasion, which is a, the first uh, overseas colonial venture of uh, the, the people who eventually became the English. And that that marks the later Middle Ages, which runs from, uh, uh, probably, you know, 11, 11, 1200 up through probably 1600. I'll give you, I should have given you that earlier. So we're looking at the, this early medieval settlement um, and we've got a chance to really understand what's going on in the first millennium here um, in this period we don't. And I'll just, before I, I go on to the animals themselves, just give you a, a few highlights of, of what people have come um, and, and just, just to acknowledge there are other things that have come out of the ground here besides the animal bones that are interesting. And I, I want to acknowledge these before we go diving into the rest of it. Um, uh, one of the things that an excavation uh, that was published in 2003 found was uh, a massive enclosing ditch. Um, this is three or four meters deep and a couple meters wide at the top. Um, that uh, good estimates they found it in a couple of places would have ringed um, the uh, edge of this uh, forming an arc around there. Interestingly, it was a large ditch that was dug, um, obviously a monumental construction, but it was filled in fairly quickly um, and then left behind. So it seems it was not an enduring marker of dividing it off the land, but it was certainly uh, something that came in. Uh, one other uh, very famous uh, uh, piece of the archaeology of Klamath Noise was the remains of which is usually touted as the uh, one of the most sophisticated bridges to come out of the first millennium anywhere in Europe. And you can see at the bottom here, um, some of the wooden footings that were found uh, in the Shannon adjacent to uh, uh, Clom McNoyce. Uh, and you can see there that the upper structure, which of course is no longer here, um, this would have crossed the Shannon River. Um, and if you know anything about Ireland, you know there are various provinces that have very deep historical roots. Uh, and the Shannon um, marks the division between two of these provinces. So this would have been a bridge off, not only across a major route way, um, it would have been uh, off into another province, another uh, you know, kind, of, kind of another state of Ireland or something along those lines. Um, so there's quite a bit that we um, know about the sites. This is a real opportunity, as I said, to uh, understand something about it. Um, but the question that's before us is, uh, within all of that archaeology, how do you find a city? What is it that qualifies something as a city? And um, if I were to ask you to imagine um, some intrepid archaeologist finding a city, you probably would come up with something like this, where you've got a Hiram Bingham sort of figure trudging through the woods and finding these, uh, you know, monumental uh, structures, palaces, temples, maybe giant marketplaces, streets, avenues, all sorts of things. Um, and it's and it's easy to sort of think about these are the things that define a city, but really they're markers for the set of social relationships that brought the city to life. Um, and um, we, what we're really after, and certainly what I'm after, is what is it that drives people to do all these sorts of things? What is it that made this a natural, logical way to be in the world? How do you get at the relationships um, that are running behind that? Um, and as you heard a little bit about before, um, I, with those social relationships in mind, um, the thing that comes most clear to me about a city is that these are settlements that do not feed themselves. Um, they are for uh, one reason or another, um, not generating all of their food. And what they need to do is to develop relationships with other groups uh, and that will cause food, raw materials, other necessities to flow into the city. Um, and that for me is the key social relationship um, at the core of a city um, and uh, that, that, that link to strangers, that link to um, people who are outside of the city somehow or other that causes you to be able to maintain yourself, to, to feed the city itself. Um, and um, that also happens to be a community 
way because I can look at things like this and these are the glories that, that humans in the past have wrought that I'm calling cities. These piles of uh, broken animal bones that uh, I have spent years looking over to understand what kind of animals that are, are there, what's happening to some of the animals there, uh, how is it that they were brought to their death there. Um, and I'm tallying up all that sort of information to try and get at what is it that brought there? What, what value system brought these animals to their demise at Clonmacnoise? Um, and one of the things that archaeologists look at is, or that I suppose, let me rephrase that, the term that archaeologists use for this phenomenon where cities have a problem feeding themselves uh, is provisioning. Um, and it's a very well-established set of ideas that um, faunal remains can give you a sense of whether or not animals are being raised very locally. Are you seeing kind of pretty much all that you would expect to uh, see where a herd is being maintained and raised and reproduced? Or are you seeing a particular slice? Um, and provisioning is the um, process of yielding some of those animals from wherever they were raised into a city. So you tend to see a narrow range of animals. Um, and then the particular types of animals that get in there are, are you begin to be able to see even more about the social relationships because those are the types of animals that for whatever reason were surrendered up from the hinterlands and brought in there. Um, for a lot of um, um, early medieval Northern Europe, um, these three things you're seeing here, certainly in, in Britain and Ireland and, and, and to an extent elsewhere, um, what you see is kind of typical patterns for um, uh, a, this sort of urban social economy of provisioning um, are uh, faunal assemblages, animal bone, piles of animal bones that have a majority of cattle um, that are female and killed at an advanced age. Um, and the logic in this case is that these are animals that have lived out their productive lives, uh, yielding uh, other cattle, yielding milk, yielding other sort of pro products. Um, and they are uh, have come to their the end of their productive lives as part of a dairy herd or other, other sorts of herd. Um, and then are are brought into these urban centers, um, and and the the you know the farmers in the countryside are releasing their essentially their superfluous animals. Um, you tend to see uh, pigs killed at a wide variety of ages um, in uh, rural settings where you have more self sufficient sort of, of settlements. Uh, you you tend to have uh, concentrated seasonal killings of pigs, um, and in cities. Pigs are often a very important hedge against fluctuations in the cattle coming and going. Um, pigs can be or wonderful animals. It can be raised in all kinds of settings. It can be fed, fed all kinds of different food. Um, one of the things you can do with pigs is keep them in your backyard. And, and uh, excavations in Dublin and other places have found the pig pens in the backyard uh, and those sorts of things. So that's an animal that you can uh, feed on all sorts of different kinds of refuse and other sorts of goods. You can have them in the, in the city for a little while, out of the city, lots of sorts of things. I mean, that becomes an available food source. Um, so this isn't actually coming in, but because of the, the uh, wobbliness in the, in the um, provisioning process, oftentimes you need a hedge against that. So you see uh, pigs uh, killed at a wide variety of ages. Uh, circumstances with goats are, are a little bit more complicated. Uh, there, there's a uh, trade in hides and manufacturing that is often important, which brings in lots of goat horns. Um, goats themselves also can, can function somewhat like pigs. They can, they can eat almost anything and they can get in there. Um, so that's just a, a quick view into what a city looks like to a faunal and to just give you a sense of it a chance to look at any of these sorts of things. Um, we can tell the age of, of cattle, for instance, here you're looking at because uh, just like you, uh, their teeth erupt uh, in a predictable way and then they wear down in a predictable way. So these are two cattle of different ages. The, cow, the uh, individual at the top um, is a young individual um, and his first molar is just erupting. Bottom one is a fully mature individual and you can see a couple of teeth that come up behind it and those brown spots are the teeth wearing down. So zooarchaeologists are going through and figuring out the age of these animals and whether or not those are the kind of age patterns. So the slaughter patterns for these animals, the uh, timing of when they were brought to their death, uh, does it match the kind of thing that you see on local farmsteads? Um, or are you just seeing a slice? And, and what you're seeing here is a 
a typical pattern for Ireland where the farmstead will have a surge of animals that are uh, killed fairly early on. These are typically uh, male cattle um, who have um, reached a reasonably large size that they um, are, are yielding a lot of meat. Uh, they're, they're growing up and keeping them longer. We're just uh, have, have you spent a lot of money, uh, spent a lot of effort and, and, and resources on uh, keeping them alive. Uh, and they're not useful for um, herd reproduction. They're probably a big pain to have around. So they tend to be killed off early. Um, and then in these herds, you see a very little mortality up until you see um, a surge in kind of um, in, in uh, elderly female cattle who have lived out the rest of their productive lives. Um, and as I said earlier, what you see in urban centers is a predominance of these uh, older cattle. And that's led to a, a very a long set of discussions in zooarchaeology that have settled fairly comfortably around the idea that what you're seeing here is uh, the elderly cattle who lived out their productive lives um, in the in the countryside are um, being walked into the urban centers um, where they will um, uh, uh, start to feed the city. So this is a, a key way in which cities are fed. Um, here you can see, just to, to finish this out, um, that graph I was showing you before is actually from Dublin, uh, from a, another site that's a decent uh, marker for a, a, a rural, um, very large, very important farmstead, but still a farmstead. Um, and then Clomagnoise in the middle there, as you can see, matches very, very closely the urban pattern. So um, how I see cities, there's a lot of it. I, there are um, 50, 60,000 I bones that identified, total assemblage of 100,000. There's a lot of other things going on. But I just wanted to raise this up for you to give you the sense that for me, a key piece of urbanism is this process of walking cattle into the city. Um, but as with the temples and everything I was showing you before, that's not urbanism itself. What that's an indication of is the set of social relationships that are making this logical. How is it that it becomes a reasonable decision to do to go through this sort of effort? What is it that causes people to walk their cattle into Clonmac Noise? Um, and that's where we get back to where I started out with the importance of being attentive to all kinds of different ways this can happen. Um, and, you know, as scientists, as, as uh, academic archaeologists, just as people, um, we can get locked into certain perspectives on how this happens. Um, and there is good reason to think that in a lot of places uh, in early medieval Europe, uh, the development of centralized rule, so sort of strong kings that are the kind of kings you eventually see leading Charlemagne, uh, the development of uh, commodity production and associated market economies are, in many cases, the driving logic. That's the set of values that is pulling cattle into cities. Um, the challenge with places like Clomac Noise, though, is that those conditions um, are not very prevalent. Um, it is the um, uh, in all of Ireland, particularly in the middle of Ireland around Clonmac Noyce, um, the level of centralized rule um, is um, minimal compared to what you see elsewhere in Europe. You just do not have a very centralized organization. Um, the uh, prevalence of intensive commodity production and trade is really low relative to those areas. So it seems odd to point to those as the key things if there's differences in their prevalence. That should lead to differences in the logic. Um, and the third part is that um, we are talking about a monastery. Um, and um, we are talking about one of the more sacred places, probably in all of Europe, certainly in Ireland at this point in time. Um, and one of the challenges of those other perspectives is they, they, have a, they have trouble accommodating that very directly into it. Um, and so there are um, that gets us into the second part um, of the um, uh, book that I wrote recently is, you know, how does that process of walking cattle into Klamath Noise, how does that fit into what we know about this as an intensely sacred place? Um, and so the, the, the theme here is, how do I make sense of what I found? How do I make sense of this process of walking cattle into Clonmac Noise. Um, and as I said before, there are differences between the kind of settings that you see down at the bottom there in Dublin and in, Cl and in Clonmac Noise. I don't want to make too much of these. These are not two absolutely different things. The various um, 
uh, dynamics that I'll be talking about in a second are not absent in Dublin and the dynamics of Dublin are not absent in Comic Noise. But I think what, what I think is going on at Comic Noise is it's because of those different social settings, different processes that are a little bit obscured or a little bit harder to see as important um, come to the fore. So we can see things that are harder to see in other locations. Um, and um, one of the reasons um, that uh, people have thought that these might be urban centers is that early medieval texts, so texts dating to around 700, call them urban centers. So, there's, you know, there's a logic there to thinking perhaps these were urban. Um, it's very helpful to have the archaeology to confirm that and to enrich it, to uh, make sure that this is not just some sort of um, exaggeration. Um, but these are called cities of refuge. Um, and that refuge part is uh, very interesting. And I think um, I, I actually prefer the more colloquial translation of sanctuary cities. Um, the concepts that people uh, wrote down about these places put sanctuary, they put sacredness, this whole suite of things that we, we put under the umbrella of religion and religious practices come right to the center. And here, um, this is the most famous um, statement about uh, these types. Of, this is not about uh, Klamath Noise, it's about another one of these. But uh, as uh, Kogatosis says here, um, since numberless, I'm sorry, I've got to move everybody here. I can't see that edge of the uh, text. Um, since numberless people assemble within it, and since the city gets its name from the fact that many people congregate there, it is a vast and metropolitan city. Together with all its outlying suburbs, it is the safest city of refuge in the whole, uh, sorry, in the whole land of the Irish for all fugitives. Um, and what I think is happening here is that this is pointing us towards some of the reasons why people thought it was a good idea to bring their cattle into it. What is it that brought people here? What do people think that they were doing when they brought their cattle to this most sacred spot? Um, and they are not sacrificed there in uh, the sense where you see in classical Mediterranean animal sacrifices. Um, they are brought to their death at Klamath Noise for the purpose of being turned into food and raw materials and these sorts of things. But I think in some ways it is worth thinking of them in that sort of sense. And, and the people who were walking to Klonmuk Noise were walking towards what they would have known as an intensely sacred place. Um, and we need to fold that into our understanding of, on a very basic level, why were they walking these animals there? But in a larger level, what is it that uh, generates urban centers? Um, and that uh full explanation of the role that things like sanctuary um, and the urge to sacrifice and the urge to uh, gather together and sacrifice um, is a big topic. And I, I don't want to burden you with all the details um, at 7.45 on, on a Thursday night. But uh, I just I want to point out a couple of things that, that hopefully will give you a sense of the direction that I'm working with this. I mean, one of them is going back to Sarah Hardy, that book that I talked about in the beginning. Um, and um, there's a lot going on in the book, but um, her emphasis on the connections amongst people um, as the crucial part um, and carefully cultivating those connections so that we can sit together on a plane um, is what she sees as the most distinctive and, and probably one of the most important qualities um, of becoming human. Um, and her quote here, um, is that the point is not to share. It isn't just we do, we do this because we need to share. Um, it's because we need to establish and maintain social networks. The actual experience of being human is creating and establishing these sorts of social networks. Um, and this perspective is part of a absolutely fascinating sea change in biological anthropology and evolutionary theory generally. Um, and you may have seen all sorts of books in the last five or six years around the um, topic of cooperation, of altruism, of sharing, and these sorts of things. Um, and Sarah Hardy is right at the core of that. Um, I, uh, there's a much larger literature there, though, 
um, uh, since since uh, I, I'm talking to a New York audience, I thought I'd pull out a book by uh, Lee Kronk uh, and Beth Leach. Lee Kronk is a anthropologist. Beth Leach is a political scientist. Um, and their book, Meeting at Grand Central, um, pulls out some uh, studies. Uh, well, the title comes rather from studies in the 60s of asking how people navigate and how they conceptualize urban environments. Um, and this in the pre-cell phone days, one of the challenges of living in a urban environment was how in the world do you connect with somebody um, if you don't know where they are or where they're going? Um, and what they talk about are these focal points that uh, we need these focal points in order to be able to connect with each other in all kinds of different ways um, and for all kinds of different purposes. Um, and so they they put meeting at Grand Central um, and what what the in the study found that when people in New York City didn't know how to get to each other. They would say, well, meet, they would, the assumption would be they would meet at Grand Central. And so there's not a grand plan to get there. It's just this is part of how we arrive in New York. This is part of how we live in New York. This is a focal point there. Um, and in some ways, they're talking about a similar phenomenon. We need these spaces to connect with each other in order to function at all. Um, and I fundamentally think by calling uh, Claw McDoyce a sanctuary city, um, by, by putting sanctuary at the center point, um, you, they, you are identifying a very crucial part of what it is that human beings need um, and that the, we have to build this into our concept of how, society, how cities work and how societies work. And that, that set of issues often gets marginalized, often gets set, set off to the side more. Um, and um, I, I think it's very important. Um, I wanted to just give you a little sense of um, if you start with this perspective. So if, and, and truly for me, Klamak noise is about people walking their cattle there. Um, I, I, and I, I, um, fold this idea into it. And part of, part of my way of bringing this idea to center is that that would have been uh, a religious act in some sense. And it certainly is the point of contact that most people would have had with the place is arriving there in this sort of setting. That would have been most people's experience of Columbus Noise. I don't think it was just an experience of delivering the groceries. This is part of a pilgrimage sort of thing. It's part of a sacred set of acts bringing there and creating this place. Um, with all that, um, I, I did want to see if you can get any sensibility of these sorts of things at this core spot. You know, is this a part that you can see in the more familiar parts of Clonmac Noise? And I mentioned this uh, high cross here as the most iconic monument, one of the most iconic monuments in early medieval Ireland, uh, certainly a focal point for Clonmac Noise. It, it is actually uh, one of the spots that marked the sanctuary that you could, the formal sanctuary you could take there and the projection, the protection that it offered. This is an icon of that kind of protection. Um, does any of this show up? Or if you approach Columbic Noise from that sort of view, from this walking cattle there view, does it change your view of this monument? Um, and um, this monument is very much uh, a presenting a worldview. Um, and I'll just give you a little sense of that. These are, um, they're called house-shaped shrines. They probably were um, containers for consecrated hosts to bring the um, sacredness of the central place out into the countryside. Um, and you'll notice that on the top of that, there's a little mimicking of the overall shape of it, kind of a second house there, so that you have a doubling of that imagery. That's linked into some um, very uh, complicated imagery um, that is built around the uh, kind of conception of how the universe was organized, that um, the, uh, and this is here, you can see out of the Book of Kells, an image of Christ sitting atop of the tabernacle, the symbol for the image of the church in this world, and you see all these people stuffed into it, um, and uh, this is a, a view of the present time, that we in this present world are trying to mimic um, the ultimate world that is going to come. We are trying to make ourselves a foreshadowing of whatever it is that was going to come before. Um, and this is a sort of sensibility that people have taken to understanding these this iconography. Um, and one of the things that uh, has historically been very, very important to people is, and these are 3D images of the crosses uh, created by the Discovery Program, uh, uh, offered up with very generous uh, use. They're wonderful images. You see that little box there. 
Um, that's often called the foundation panel. Um, and it's best interpreted as, as an image of a king and a bishop founding the settlement. Um, and this is a very um, standard view, and it's seen as the role of what it is that founded Comic Noise. And it's fitting Comic Noise back into that Europe-wide pattern. Um, and it certainly is a piece of what was founding it. But what strikes me as a person who comes to these places through animals is all of the chaotic animal imagery on these. And one of the things that has both uh, driven people nuts in trying to understand them, but also absolutely charmed them is all of the um, very mundane and lively um, uh, imagery that you get with animals. You have hunting scenes along the base. Um, you have these famous two cats that are uh, set in very deep 3D as if they're sitting at the base of the cross with with prey in their in their um, in their claws. You've got a deer over here caught in a trap. These are scenes of the world around us. Um, and um, I don't have time to go into the details of how all of the iconography works. Um, partly these are uh, designed to identify what the role of the monastery, what the role of the church, and what the role of Clon McNoise is in the world. And the presence of the animals, both in these lower registers and the upper registers, I, I think of if you're standing before these, and if you're one of these people who's just bringing your cattle to the place, it would give you a place at uh, these monasteries that we neglect otherwise. And it helps us to see that these monasteries are... Um, bringing people together and they were conceptualized with the kind of very mundane agricultural scenes and all this sort of stuff are very much a part of the iconography, um, which, which is part of how I can start to broaden out the larger mission of the monastery. Um, you might notice the uh, house shape on the top um, here, which is very much like the house shape that I showed you before. Um, but you'll notice that in this case, the house shape is not replicated. Um, and in all of these little house shaped shrines, you have the overall shape is the representation of the contemporary world, the world that we're trying to reform. That little shape is the icon of the goals that we have, our aspirations for how the world should look. Um, up at the top there, you have that. You don't have any doubling. Um, and if we we're all together, I would take a minute to ask you, where is the doubling of the monastery um, with the waving of hands and whatnot and my ability to handle the chat? I'm not going to go ahead and do that. But in this case, there is no doubling on the cross itself. The monastery itself is the doubling of it. It is a the presence around the monastery is the world that we are is being drawn together there and these animals are very much drawn into it uh, with their agriculture with the uh, bodiness of them with the very body of it and i see that doubling as knitting the whole monastery together as bringing the animals that by and large would have lived down by the shannon river uh, up into the center into the core of the iconography um, as a crucial piece of what it is that brought clomac noise to life um, they are uh, as much an emblem of the sanctuary there um, and as much an emblem of the people who created the sanctuary and uh, had the benefits of the sanctuary um, as that. Um, and these are, um, so really what I'm doing is trying to put the cattle um, and the very mundane, apparently uh, profane things that are going on down by the um, riverside uh, on the same footing as the more obviously sacred monuments, that these are all part of filling something together. Um, and um, that is the view of, of Clon McNoise that I'm, I'm trying to, to develop um, and a way to understand how it is these ideas about sanctuary and sacredness could create a city, um, not uh, a city where you happen to have a, de a thing develop around a monastery, but that the actual sacredness ends up generating the city itself. Um, and uh, just to circle back to where we started, um, I, I think um, if you look back on how it is that we conceptualized what we needed to do in the face of COVID, um, we did not keep this sort of stuff uh, at the center of our conceptions as we should. We very blithely locked ourselves in the room. We very blithely cut away the ties that make us human, that allow us to cultivate all of these um, amazing cap capabilities that we had. And that is precisely what 
not only what Sarah Hardy would have predicted, it is actually what she predicts uh, in this book. Um, so thank you very much. Um, that's a very quick tour through a whole lot of information. I hope it gives you a sense of, of how a zoo archaeologist looks at um, sacred places and animals and uh, the roots of the world that we live in. Uh, thank you very much. And I, I, hopefully we can have a little bit of discussion. I will. I can thank you. Up. Thank you so much, John. Um, normally, there would be a warm round of applause, and I see <laughs> several people. I can see the, uh, I can see the icons. Virtually, yeah. Um, <clears throat> that was a, a very, very interesting lecture for a part of the world. We, uh, the, we don't get to hear a lot. So you, you gave us um, a different context, but you also tackled ma major issues on urbanization and the economy uh, that comes with it that uh, are basically uh, cut across different uh, chronological periods and, uh, and regions. So I want to open the floor to our audience to to for questions or uh, clarifications. Yes, Pam, please. Well, that was that was wonderful, and I really enjoyed it. And um, two reactions. One is I was struck by in the base of the Klondike noise um, church, uh, across which I haven't seen for a long time. I saw that back when I worked with Bernard Wales fifty years ago. But <laughs> it's very much like the one at Castle Dermot, which is of course closer to that island I've seen with the hunting scenes and the animals on the bottom, and and I think that's fabulous. And the other thing that struck me on the more mundane side is how nicely your data fit with Jennifer Bordillon's data. Um, because just for everybody else there, that Jennifer Bordillon um, is an archaeologist who did the animal bone work on Hamwick, Hamwick which is um, medieval Southampton. And was, it was really the path breaking, you know, what do towns look like showing that in fact, you were getting all these older cattle being drawn in. Uh, the model that we now use really comes out of the work that she did uh, back in the 1970s. And and I mean, your aging data are just a real mirror for that, which I think is, you know, really in terms of making your case is absolutely fabulous. Yeah, fairly, fairly astonishing. And, and um, uh uh, you know, she she was writing at a time when when you know, got a very particular view of how this came about, and and um, you know, and struggled with that a little bit in, in her writing to try and think of well, what what is it that is causing these things to flow around? But no, it's it's really extraordinary how similar the, these these uh, these places are in terms of the kinds of animals that are coming in uh, and and the the structures develop around it, and I think it's, that makes it all fascinating to think about each place would have had a whole different set of values that would cause these cattle to move across and i'm glad you mentioned the, the other ones these are very common pieces of of early medieval iconography and they they have really bedeviled people it's just it's very hard to figure out where they fit in um and um uh, it, but they're 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 right at the center of it um and and it, it's been fun it's been fun to get a chance to to work with them um, I saw I, I, something flashed up in the chat about. Yes, the, I the can, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'm happy to read the question. And, Thank you. I appreciate it. And to all the audience, uh, you can either go ahead like Pam uh, and, and speak yourself or enter the question in uh, the chat box. So the question relates to what you were just talking about, uh, iconography. Are there cattle on the monumental cross? Or is it pigs and goats? Yes, th there's a pretty broad range. Um, they uh, th there are a, a couple of cattle. There's there's a, a scene on one of it's not a comic noise, but a scene on another one that uh, is uh, a, it, it's a it's a hard one to see. It's kind of worn down, but it might in fact be somebody milking a cow. So they they do show up. Uh, sheep are very common. Um, this is uh, and I'm just trying to think. Um, I am pretty sure that I'll have to, I have to go check. I, I, I've got to go back and look at this. Um, I don't think there are uh, outside. Sorry, in the hunting scenes, there are pigs. There are, there are wild, there are wild boar. There are dogs. There are deer. 
Um, there are um, there is a wonderful cat uh, on the side of the cross of scriptures of Columbic noise that is vigorously cleaning itself, um, which is is just wonderful. It's got its legs splayed and it leaves a very natural view of the cat, which is striking, not what you expect to see uh, on a um, uh, on these crosses, which which are you know they, they are there is a a um, biblical iconography here that is you know they're working out biblical messages. So there's an element of them that are kind of didactic, but a lot of the people who've had the most trouble with these discordant elements. So a cat licking its derriere um, doesn't fit well with the program. You can you can kind of get it in there, but it, but it's always uncomfortable. Um, and there's just this exuberant joy to these animals that, that, that's fun that's that's fun to see in there. Um, but it's a, it's a relatively broad range. Thank you, John. Thank you. Um, um I'll uh, want to to give people a, a few moments to think about yeah. uh, any questions. But um, I was wondering um, uh, when I was reading about your work to introduce you, I was excited with your current project because it relates vaguely to some of my own research interests. And I was wondering it's, if it's too much to ask for some insights in this current work on M McDermott's rock. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to. So um, the in the 12th century, um, for a, a variety of reasons, um, the Anglo-Normans um, come across the Irish Sea and um, gain control fairly quickly of uh, quite a bit of the island. Um, and particularly in the East, uh, institute uh, a lot of the changes that make uh, uh, or, uh, Irish society more familiar in other places. So you start getting castles, you get uh, rent economies where uh, individuals are getting access to the land from somebody who lives in the castle and they're paying rent to the person in the castle. And you get all sorts of changes. You get a, you get a surge forward in a market economy. And uh, it, it, that's the point where you get a full urban network. So cities in Ireland would look very familiar at that point. So huge sea changes um, in Ireland and in many ways bringing Ireland into line with a lot of the things, a lot of the ways it hasn't quite been in there. You get uh, church reform. So you have uh, much more highly centralized churches. They're not uh, regional churches, the, the, the kind that, that, that Charlemagne really didn't like. Um, they start to fade and you start to get regularized orders that, that are, are have a very clear um, place in, in various social hierarchies. Um, but that uh, is sort of a high tide of that fairly quickly. And then it, it, it takes hold in, in a good chunk of the eastern part of the island. But um, some parts of the island out, uh, some parts of the island out west are never uh, conquered. Other parts, Clon McNoise uh, and this site that I'm working is just a little bit north of Clon McNoise, were briefly under um, control, direct control of Anglo-Normans, but then faded fairly, that all faded fairly quick. So there's a castle you might've noticed at Klopikos is actually an Anglo-Norman castle built and then destroyed and inhabited 30 years later. So very kind of quick. And um, as you know, people have thought about colonial circumstances, you sort of, with a kind of progress narrative, sort of, the thing you concentrated on are the bringing of a market economy in and all those sorts of things. Um, the, um, about, 20 years ago, as in many places, we began to think, well, perhaps we ought to think about the indigenous experience here. And, you know, how did you know, indigenous people weren't just living in the past? How are they responding? And then in these zones of contact where you get these really complicated swirls of uh, strategies and identities and, and all kinds of really complicated processes, you know, that becomes sort of a, the heart of our understanding of colonialism. People began to look at uh, Gaelic areas. So that's the word for these uh, more indigenous areas of the of of the island um, began to look at those you know, what, what, how did they respond to the enormous changes that are going out east and um, as luck would have it um, there have been a lot of good excavations but um, a lot of them just didn't yield as much material as we wanted. So we weren't getting the kind of really fine grained view of it. Um, and the excavations of McDermott's Rock are one of a uh, couple of excavations that, that have started to happen recently. They've really finally, after 20 years of looking, have opened up a real peek into how were these groups organizing their lives out west beyond the direct influence of them. So how are they responding to it? Were the McDermott Lords 
seeing what's happening out east and saying, yeah, that's a the direction we want to go, or 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 is it going others? You just don't know. So um, the guy who runs this uh, site has been working in this area for twenty or thirty years, and he's got a pretty good sense of the landscape, um, but. Um, the island, which is about 200 meters offshore, um, is known to be a, um, uh, a, a retreat of some kind. One of the words for it is Cranog. It's, it's a, a place where you would go, you know, perhaps for defense when you really had to hunker down, but also probably just to gather in a special spot, you know, your, your island vacation for picnics and that sort of stuff. So, um, we have been we've got uh, three seasons of excavation at the site, uh, and it has just been the most ridiculously productive site. I've, I've told I, I've told my students from Denison that I have now wrecked their archaeological career because they will never be on a site where they'll be finding this stuff. So we would I mean, we, we kept finding we probably found 10 or 15, maybe even 20 things that, you know, in any other excavation I've been on my whole career, one or two of them would have made the whole season. So um, wow. lots of material culture, lots of uh, interesting architectural stuff, and most important of all, a gigantic pile of really, really well-preserved animal bones. So this is an opportunity to look at feasting. And of course, just I, I, I mean, a, a, the, the thread that ties this to my earlier work is this is a gathering place. It's a place where people gathered and how they gathered there will give you a lot of sense of the dynamics there. So I'm, I'm just beginning to look at the material and try and get a sense of, um, you know, does this look like just ordinary kitchen refuse? Do you see things that are um, unusual in the way that people tend to expect uh, of feasting behavior? Um, and I think I probably am seeing some of that. Um, there's there's a lot of it that start, is starting to look like um, that we do have pe a lot of people gathering there and they had lots of pigs living out there. Um, one odd thing, which if Pam's still around, I, I, I need help figuring out the pigs have a lot of oral pathologies. <laughs> so I think they're living out on the island. So I'm just, I'm just beginning to sort of sort through that. But I think it's, it's going to be the really first time where we're going to get a sense of, you know, how was this fairly high status gathering point? What were they doing? And is it the same thing that's happening in the English castles where they have a high status gathering over there? Or is there another set of things that are, are organizing this area? Um, so it, it should be a lot of fun. Yes, it sounds very exciting and maybe a reason to have you back uh, in a few years' time to, to hear. I love it. Yeah. yeah. No, and, and PC, have a... PC is a wonderfully rich topic. Um, yeah, like exactly. Some of the other things we're talking about, people uh, are looking at it in all kinds of different ways. And you we're in a moment where there are just lots of rich ideas about what you're looking at. Uh, so it's yeah. wonderful. I, I know what you mean. I, I see Alexandra has a question, please. Hi. Um, hi. I was really curious. You mentioned that uh, Clan McNoise was a sanctuary city and a really, really well-known sanctuary city, or at least one that people wrote about. And I was curious about if you had a sense of what drew people here in particular, of what sort of really made it what it was. And thank you. This was a really wonderful presentation. It's an, it's an excellent question. Um, and uh, you know, there are contemporary things. So it, uh, some of the most uh, famous manuscripts that we know from early medieval Ireland are written there. So it was just a big deal. It was, it was a school. People traveled from elsewhere in Europe to go there. So there are lots of contemporary things there, though. Um, but I think if, if I'm following the direction you're thinking, and certainly a direction I like to think in, um, is, um, you know, is there a longer history here? So the earliest good archaeological evidence that we have for... Um, monastic style habitation there is probably between six and seven hundred um and that matches up reasonably well not too much longer after we have it founded but the excavation also did come up with a tiny bit of uh iron age activity um so there were some large post holes and things that were hard for the excavator to resolve into any okay absolutely what we're seeing here but it's it, it's a very evocative sort of thing. So, um, and we know from some of the place name lore from the area that the there probably is a very long term sense that this is a special spot. Um, and um, Pam Crabtree is one of the um, people who has pushed forward our understanding of the Iron Age early, the Iron Age ceremonial centers that are very much in the background of these um, and unequivocally. 
people would have thought of Clon McNoise as inheriting the mantle of those earlier places, a famous place called Rathcroen, which is just a little bit north of there, um, which is a phenomenal Iron Age archaeological landscape, uh, redolent with mythology and all kinds of things. And we have a poem which says, you know, Clon McNoise inherited the mantle of that. So the very, so I think there's, there are long-term reasons there. So, um, you know, I think very rich, deep history of why people would have thought this was a special place. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think uh, that's a that's a very good moment to thank you very much once more, John, for for this uh, fascinating presentation, for introducing us to the archaeology uh, uh, of in the or in an area we don't hear a lot about. Thanks again, and thank you. Um, uh, thank, you. thank you very much. I enjoyed it quite a bit. And if anybody has additional questions, I'm, I'm certainly happy to answer emails or chat or whatever. Um, I'm at Dennis University and and uh, would love to love to keep chatting. Thank you again. It was a pleasure. Have a good uh, night, John. It was you great. Also. Thank, thank you again. Your research. Bye bye, everyone. Bye bye.